Pleasure to be here. Thanks. And thanks for writing this book. It's really great. I mean, I've been been deep into it. <laughs> I feel like we've been talking, but I look forward to the real conversation. Adi. Ornith is joining from Israel. Wow. Adi is joining from, from San Francisco. Actually, I should keep. Shall I start? Um, yep, um, everyone is in from the waiting room, so if you want to get started. Okay. Let me welcome you all to, uh, to this uh, book, Adda. I'm um, Ashutosh Varshne, Director of the Center for Contemporary South Asia and Professor of Political Science at Brown. This is our first book, Adda, for the, of the year. And it's a forum that we have created at the center to discuss significant new books in our field. Um, the book we have chosen for today's discussion is India's founding moment, the constitution of a most surprising democracy, published earlier this year by Harvard University Press. The author is Madhav Khosla who holds joint faculty positions at Columbia Law School and at Ashoka University in Sonipat, India. He is joining us from Delhi, not from New York. We have chosen three commentators. Um, Corey Brett Schneider, uh, my colleague here in political science department at Brown, uh, who works at the intersection of constitutional law and political theory. His specialization is the United States, so he'll be able to offer comparative reflections for us to consider um, on this book. Our second commentator will be Louis Stillen, who is the director of King's India Institute in London. Much of her work and widely noted work is on federalism, Indian federalism. And so I've invited her uh, to comment on the um, federalism part of the book, uh, attractively titled Location of Power, the chapter, which discusses where power should be located in Delhi or in states. Sunil Amrit is our third commentator. Re he is Renu, uh, Renu, he's Renu and Anand Dhawan Professor of History and Chair of South Asian Studies Council at Yale University. Until some months ago, he was teaching at Harvard. Uh, he's a MacArthur Fellow from 2017, and his specialization is South Asian history. Uh, we have invited, I have invited him to offer us historical reflections. Um, I have reviewed this book myself uh, a few months ago in Boston Review. So let me very briefly say what, in my judgment, is distinctive about Madhav's book, a viewpoint that the commentators here may or may not uh, agree with, may not share. First of all, um, I am an empirical political scientist and primarily who uses political theory, uh, um, reads political theory, but doesn't contribute to political theory. And India's democracy, uh, we know from the empirical social science perspective has been analyzed and its exceptional nature noted by some leading scholars of democracy, empirical scholars of democracy, such as Barrington Moore as early as 1966, Robert Dow, arguably the, the most important scholar uh, in the field of democracy, uh, at least empirically so, 1971, 1989, 2008, and Adam Sworsky. Um, in 2000, all of them commenting on the exceptional nature of Indian democracy from a comparative and historical perspective and uh, saying something about it. Uh, Dahl and Barrington more, much more than Adam Chworsky. But uh, political philosophers, with some exceptions, have not analyzed the book and certainly not analyzed it at great length until Martha's book arrived on the scene. Uh, second, India's constitution, as opposed to its democracy, 
has been analyzed from the perspective of history. Rohit Day at Yale published a book uh, last year, and we discussed it at another book at Dyed Brown. And of course, long ago, the classic by his, the historian Granville Austin. Uh, I can also think of uh, um, uh, Sudhir Krishna, Krishna, uh, Krishnamurti, who's, who's and, and, and uh, uh, Austin, they have discussed India's constitution primarily in the perspective of legal debates and the others as well. But again, political philosophy as a subfield has not been applied or its ideas have not been used as systematically um, um, as in this book. That's my view. And perhaps uh, the political theorist here, um, um, Corey Brett Schneider will have more to say. Um, Madhav will speak for 15 minutes, up to 15 minutes, summarizing his arguments. Then each commentator will have up to 12 minutes to present their remarks. Madhav will respond if he wants to for up to 10 minutes after the uh, comment commentators have spoken. And then we'll, we will be left with about 25 minutes for Q&A. And I'll be picking your questions through the chat function. I'll be, I'll be doing that myself, picking some of the questions that we, that we should uh, submit uh, to uh, Madhav in particular, but to the panel in general, uh, questions that appear um, on the screen through the chat function. So let's start. Um, Madhav Kosla uh, on his uh, new book uh, for 15 minutes. Madhav. Thanks so much, Ashu. I'm really grateful to you and to Sini, to Luis, to Pori for sort of taking out the time for this and for reading it. It's not, um, I mean, it may be many things, but it's not the most fun use of one's time. And so I'm really grateful to all of you for having read it. I, I'm not going to sort of spend a lot of time summarizing the book or anything, but what I will just say is a little bit about why I was prompted to write it or the kind of curiosity that drove the project, which is that it actually, it, it came to me after or in the course of thinking a lot about a very wide and important range of scholarship on 19th century political thought, which looked at the justifications for empire. And there've been a number of books that were published over the last two decades. You know, Jennifer Pitts, Karuna Mantena, Shankar Muthu, Uday Mehta, a range of books about how is it that empire was justified and rationalized and supported by 19th century political thought. And what comes out in that body of work is that you, if, if you're just to sort of speak in, in very general terms, you would say that in around 1850, there are very few people in the world who think that democracy can exist everywhere. And a hundred years later, there are very few people who think the opposite. And that's quite strange. And it's quite bizarre. And so I sort of read this work on the middle of it, on, on the 19th century on how you could think that certain kinds of societies are only suited to certain types of governments um, and vice versa. And I basically wondered what happens when this story ends? How do you suddenly arrive at the mid 20th century where democracy is exploding everywhere? And why is it that these post-colonial nations are actually so happy to embrace universal suffrage at one go? Why do they think that that's the thing to do? And of course, the answer can't be that some previous experiments with democracy that have been radical have worked well, because if anything, the interwar period is a really horrific example, right? You have countries that become democratic and then basically none of them survive as such. And so one was sort of this gap that I, I that I that really began to puzzle me, right? And it came and, and I and it struck me then at some point that look, India's constitutional founding is actually part of the answer to that question. Because it's a moment where they think that what they're doing has never been done before, which in and of itself is not suggestive of anything. We all think that we are doing things that nobody's done before and it's almost never true. 
But, um, but the thing is that they genuinely believe that there is no precise historical precedent. And they are more familiar with the arguments against democracy on Indian soil than perhaps anybody else. So that was one, I would say, missing intellectual puzzle, which I couldn't have a direct answer to. The second was a puzzle within Indian history, which is that there's an outpouring of literature on the British Empire, and especially law, increasingly law during the colonial empire. There's an outpouring of literature on the nationalist movement, you know, whether on major figures like Gandhi, Ambedkar, Nehru, or even whether on the ways in which freedom was achieved. But there's very little on India's constitutional moment. And like Ashu mentioned, it's basically, there's only one book, right? There's a 1966 book by Granville Austin. And that in and of itself is not puzzling to me on the face of it, because maybe there is no story to be told. So I was very happy to sort of say, okay, look, maybe there's only one book because there's no story, right? And maybe there shouldn't be a second book. Maybe India's constitutional founding isn't that special. But it became strange to think that if you looked at debates outside India, suddenly India's founding is odd, given everything that's happened. You read the Constituent Assembly debates, they think they're doing something special, but we've underappreciated it. So among sort of history, um, among Indian history, it had been really underappreciated, right? And there was only, and it was all on partition and so on and so forth, rather than the fact that that moment itself had any ideological significance. And the two other areas of writing where it was similarly underappreciated, one was just simple comparative public law, comparative constitutional law. People who think about constitutional moments globally think of course about the late 18th century and those are the moments that have left a kind of remarkable image on our mind but they or they think of you know things like maybe the arab spring or they think of you know the south african constitutional revolution and you don't really think of the india and then of course within comparative politics there's this outpouring of literature on why did india survive or how did it survive but very little about why actually they wanted to become democratic. So I, I didn't find any answer to the question that why didn't India institute the suffrage in a graduated way? I, I just, I, it, it was puzzling to me that nobody had really sort of thought about that. And so it came out of an, a, a kind of interest in both having a deeper sense or trying to unpack both Indian history and Indian political and constitutional thought, but also the broader trajectory of modern constitutionalism. And part of what the book's argument is, is actually just the very fact of the topic of the book, right? In part, at its most elementary level, my argument is that India's constitutional moment is itself a revolution, right? And so the very, so regardless of what kind of whether you think the debates are accurately portrayed or are meaningful or so on and so forth. For me, the topic of the book itself was an argument because the topic of the book basically suggests or tries to suggest that if the American founding is justly iconic and significant because it makes the argument that democracy can exist anywhere, I think the Indian founding is important because it makes the argument that democracy can exist everywhere. And so you have a particular moment where constitution making and democratization occur simultaneously. And they occur simultaneously in a terrain that's poor, illiterate, divided by language, caste, gender, so on and so forth, and burdened by centuries of tradition. And there isn't really, in my mind, a historical predecessor or analog where you're trying to create democratic citizens through democratic politics, where you basically say that, look, the people, that, that everything that you think about India not being fit for democracy is a consequence of the kind of politics that it's been subject to. 
And if you subject it to a different kind of politics, you will actually get a different kind of people. And that's a very modern impulse, right? Modern in the sense that it fits into sort of the sort of post 16th century idea that look, we, our lives are perfectly, our, our lives are, can, our lives are, are perfect candidates for being constructed. Our world is, has a constructability to it and we can remake it as we want, right? And that's what modern politics promised. Modern politics promised the idea that we can remake our world and we can do it by peaceful means. And so that sort of was the thought that drove the book, that India was the interesting example of that. And then the book is sort of unpacks what the institutional architecture was that you would have to use to actually wire the people differently. So, you know, the idea is that if you put people in a different institutional setting and that can enable a kind of self-sustaining politics, you'll get very different people. And if you put them in a different setting and on a different kind of politics, you will get a very different people. And this particular setting is, of course, marked out in the book, right? And in some ways, it, it resembles much of what has come to be familiar to scholars of sort of democratic liberal constitutionalism in the 20th century. But I think what's important is the ways in which those debates make their way into the Indian political imagination, right? The role of actually constitution making and the purpose of a, a big text or a purpose of a text that can in some sense establish norms because it needs to substitute a democratic consensus that doesn't exist debates around you know the fear of actually power that isn't centralized because of a real fear of indian society right and so a recognition of the fact that look actually a lot of this place isn't ready for democracy. And the only thing that can make it ready for democracy is a state, right? And the third is a kind of representative model unmediated by identity, given by the idea that actually, if you put people under certain representative frameworks, you will get certain kinds of politics. So that's that's kind of the, um, that I mean, I, 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 th I think I'll stop there, right? Because I, I don't want to sort of say, too much more about it, but I do think that that's that for me at least what was meaningful or interesting was to at least suggest at a very modest level that this is a story worth telling right and, and, I, and I think it's a story that's been sort of not not fully captured. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Madhav. So the uh, a very important point here, which I hope uh, uh, our commentators will discuss and uh, and our audience also is is uh, the the counterintuitive uh, 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 claim that democracy does not depend on certain preconditions, which has been a very important argument in the field. Of course, uh, if the standard preconditions that were laid out right since John Stuart Mill until uh, later. Um, were, were uh, they, if they held for all societies, then India would not be democratic. And the claim, the counterintuitive claim here is that Indian uh, uh, founding fathers, quote unquote, a thought of making democratic citizens through a democratic polity. So politics would create institutional structure and the practice, democratic institutional structure, and the practice of democracy will create democratic citizens, hmm? regardless of what the socio, prior socioeconomic conditions were. This is a, a fundamentally counterintuitive claim, and the book goes into how uh, uh, the, the founding fathers thought about it and how they put in place the details of the institutional architecture. So let's now go to Corey, Corey Brett Schneider, uh, who, as I said, works at the intersection of constitutional law and political theory. And let's see what he has to say on Martha's book. Corey. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, that was a great introduction to the book, but overly modest one. I mean, I do think it is a major achievement um, for reasons that Ashu is getting to. Uh, and it brings into dialogue, I think, in just the appropriate way, showing the history of the dialogue, but also the intellectual dialogue between 
constitutional theory, democratic theory, uh, which has mostly been US based and what we can, not just using tools <laughs> that have been developed in thinking about the US to think about India, but quite the contrary, what we can learn, I think from the Indian example and from the Indian theories, ways that they've improved on the American experiment. Let me say just, first of all, something about the main idea. I mean, one of the great achievements of the book just lays in the framing in the very beginning, which is uh, to say, look, there's this long history in political theory, uh, not just John Stuart Mill, but his father as well, saying that, um, no, India can't have a democracy because it doesn't have the right kind of democratic culture. It's not just a question of the conditions, but it doesn't have the ethos is the term that you rightly use to describe it. And the kind of battering ram of the book, it's, it's uh, not just its thesis, but the evidence that it pr presents is that that is absolutely wrong. And now how did, how was it disproved? It was disproved in much the way that, that um, constitutional theorists talk about the US experiment, that constitutions don't just sort of reflect the culture, they create it. They ed create a sort of system of education. And as you say, the beginning of the founding moment is the beginning both of the founding of a constitution, but really of a democracy. And the reason why that was, why it happened and why we can't, shouldn't doubt anymore that it's possible because we have a shining example of how it did happen. Uh, maybe more so actually than the United States, which of course is you know, such a, a proto-democratic nation in the 18th century. We have such a small percentage of the population involved in the franchise. And we have from the beginning, of course, not just disenfranchisement, but, but enslavement of a significant portion, large portion of the population. So in many ways, even though the US is talked about this way, that the constitution constitutes the democratic polity, it's really not true. I mean, it's something that happens over time. And in the 19th century is really the beginning of, the, of if there's a moment, it's the passage of the uh, 13th, 14th and 15th amendments. But in India, we do have an example where the constitution constitutes the polity and gives the lie to, you know, it's not an accident. I don't, I don't think that that Mill and James Mill were racist in their descriptions of Indian society, that they thought it wasn't possible. But it was also beyond their imagination, I think, that you could really, from the beginning, use the structure of the polity to create this democracy. So that's the achievement of the book, no doubt. And actually, I would say well beyond anything in American constitutional theory, because we just don't have that story, it is the primary example, as I now see it, of that idea that the Constitution can constitute a democratic polity, the thesis of the book. So of course, I have questions and comments, um, and I will try not to go on too long, although we could talk about this for a very long time. I'll also say that another model of the book uh, that I just really enjoyed is the reality, you know, instead of kind of here's this polity, here's another, here's this constitution, here's another, and doing comparison in that way. The book's history is so detailed and the archival research, the work to figure out what actually happened in these foundings, so well done. Uh, and one of the moments that I'll point to, both because I think it's historically relevant, but also relevant to the deep question I wanna ask, is the um, interaction between the, the framers of the Indian Constitution and major jurists, Supreme Court justices, for instance, in the United States. And I'm thinking in particular around 65, um, 64, 65, until the conclusion of that wonderful chapter on the grammar of constitutionalism, uh, which is really illustrating the, the nitty gritty, the grammar of how India uses its constitution to constitute a democratic people, uh, there's an, you know, you see the way that these fluid back and forths are happening. They don't have to start from scratch. They're looking at the American experiment over time, not the 18th century, but the current moment. And they're trying to figure out what's the best that we can take from this uh, idea. And one thought, you know, which I want to come back to is maybe what we need is a substantive due process jurisprudence. And uh, that's a kind of shorthand for those who don't know, for the idea that the American constitution isn't just about the explicit text, but is about more fundamental democratic values, values of liberty and values of um, um, including the right to privacy, most significantly, the right to an abortion, the things that are on the table precisely at this moment. And the dialogue that ensues is really a consideration. Do we want this kind of jurisprudence or we do want a more limited one, a procedural due process jurisprudence? And at that moment, uh, Justice Frankfurter, it sounds like, has influence and convinces 
uh, the framers that, no, we want this more, at least at this moment, procedural approach to democracy. And they don't lay out certainly an explicit substantive due process guarantee. Uh, but to me, I mean, I was fascinated not just as a, as a question of, um, uh, of history, but as a question of the deep question that we're really after here, which is what is it about a constitution that can constitute a democratic people? And in some ways, the book, I think, emphasizes the ways in which kind of proxies, structures that are not explicitly about education can educate. Uh, and I'll say what I mean by that. Uh, there's a discussion of the way that the text and its formation creates this constitution. The nationalization, which I know we'll talk about more, the, the focus on national government rather than state. Uh, and the attention to caste, but with some caveats about ways that maybe, uh, even though caste was uh, considered over time, that, that um, religion was not. Um, and so when I mean proxies, I guess I think at this moment, when I think of our own national experiment in the United States and where we are, I am not sure that we have succeeded in answering, um, even if India has, I'm interested if, if you think there are the same dilemmas here, uh, the challenge that John Stuart Mill and James Mill raised. Um, they were raising it about uh, non-white cultures in a racist way, but I'll raise the same challenge about our own polity. Have we succeeded in our imperfect constitution, amended over time, deeply undemocratic at the beginning, but uh, becoming increasingly democratic in the 19th century with the passage of the 13th Amendment outlining uh, enslavement of people, the 14th guaranteeing equal protection, and the 15th guaranteeing the right, non-discrimination and the right to vote. Have we succeeded in, in really creating what they referred to as a democratic society, or are we so vulnerable to the kind of collapse that they feared would happen in a country like India if it happened in the United States, because uh, we don't have a democratic society. And I guess maybe it will be provocative, but I think that there's a chance that the, the Indian experiment might be more successful than the American one, and I'm gonna say why. The first is that the success or failure that, that Mill and his father were aiming at India hinges on the idea that if it doesn't matter what the institutions are, if they're not reinforced by the citizenry, if there's not belief in them, then the legitimacy will be a very shallow one. And there'll be ways in which the vulnerabilities, the cracks will come out through the culture. One thing I know that is a challenge in India, of course, is questions of caste still and questions of religion. Here, those questions are uh, far from being answered, extremely prevalent, and I'll say this, how that's true in a, in a couple of ways. One is there is a lack of understanding of how the system is supposed to work, that's clear. And that might be a result of a failure of education, uh, a failure to explicitly lay out in our national conversation, national constitution, uh, a guarantee of a right to be educated, not just about the structure, not just educated in certain sense of literacy, but about the, the structure and values of the way the system is supposed to operate. And what that's enabled is a significant portion of the country to be vulnerable to the idea uh, that what the American experiment is about is anything but democratic. In other words, the idea of Carl Schmitt shared by our president that what democracy is is simply electing a leader who then can come in and do whatever he or she wants. Uh, the state constitutions did lay out rights to uh, education, some of them. Um, not civic education, but I think the sort of this might be an instance where our own federalism might be a failing in the way possibly India's is not. We don't have a national guarantee of education and we're seeing uh, that failure uh, in many ways. The second vulnerability, uh, possible failure of the American experiment when it comes to democratic society independent uh, the constitution uh, and I'm interested here, you know, I think we did do things that maybe India didn't, and yet there's a question as to whether they'll work. One thing that we did do in the structure of our national constitution uh, over time is create an equal protection clause that, that demands that under law we are all equal regardless of race. That's a national guarantee, even though we don't have as much of a national system from the beginning, that really infuses every level of government and is a guarantee. Uh, and then it is about caste, as this sort of recent popular work points out. 
Uh, the language of caste is often used in the 19th century to elaborate this. Justice Harlan uses it. It's used currently in the jurisprudence to talk about the idea that under law, no person, regardless of not just race, uh, but increasingly gender, certainly religion, can be subject to discrimination. But even here, the hollowness of the guarantee it's enshrined into law hasn't necessarily, has not, let's just say, infused into culture when you have um, some estimates as much as 40% endorsing some form of white supremacy. The idea of a guarantee against white supremacy might be hollow. We haven't, in other words, created the democratic society that would go along with it. Uh, the, the formal guarantee. Um, uh, so, I mean, <laughs> I guess my provocative question is, in many ways, the founding of India is a response to the question of whether or not you can have a democratic polity um, without a democratic society. The answer was clearly yes. There is an ongoing democratic polity with universal suffrage. Uh, nationalization was one way of dealing with this, universal suffrage, the creation of the Constitution, educated people through proxies. Uh, in the U.S., though, I'm not sure that the same experiment has worked. I mean, in fact, I'm suggesting something stronger, which is that it's failed, that we have a failure to infuse, and now we'll come back to the debate with Frankfurter, the substantive values that undergird the American Constitution into the polity. I wonder if that's a failure of textual drafting, a failure to be explicit about rights, for instance, the right to civic education, the right to education generally. Um, uh, and I, I, I don't know how you get out of it. I mean, because I think it, it suggests a kind of vulnerability. Um, it might be, you know, Ashu and I and, and Rich Snyder have been talking about ways in which different systems are, are vulnerable or not. And it might be that the American system, because of the presidential structure, and the creation of a presidential structure going alongside um, the, the, the creation of an, an attempted creation over time of a democratic polity makes it particularly vulnerable to that Carl Schmitt theory that the president is simply elected and can do whatever he or she wants, including disparage the substantive values that I'm talking about. Maybe we're more vulnerable because of the structure of our constitution. And uh, interestingly, even though federalism is meant to protect rights, that might also be a way that the Constitution has failed to be infused. So uh, in sum, I'm making, a, I think, a, 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 point, a, a couple of points that are controversial. One is I'm not sure that it's right that you can avoid a substantive theory or a substantive account of constitutionalism to have a democratic culture. And while at that moment on that specific debate, there are lots of reasons for being broad in the in the text in a way of not enshrining substantive due process explicitly, I worry that a lack of understanding of the substantive values of democracy risks a kind of vulnerability of the deeper kind, that we risk an undemocratic society, uh, that as Mill worried, not, he was precisely got it wrong, not in the place he thought this might happen, but in the place where most commentators thought there was a success in the American polity, that there is a true vulnerability that there's a failure of a democratic society to undergird um, and reinforce what's supposed to be a democratic structure. Our presidential system only makes that more vulnerable. I'll give you one of the shocking facts that many of you might know, uh, but it certainly was shocking to me from our little discussion group that Ashu, Rich, and I have had. There are only two presidential systems that have survived collapse into essentially dictatorship, suspension of elections being the standard, uh, and that's the United States and Costa Rica. Uh, and I'm not sure about the American experiment, given this problem. So I think you've shown that India, the racism of Mill is right, that India uh, is the answer to that challenge, that to think somehow that the culture can't be created through the Constitution, it can be, but the question is how? And the question of the United States, as opposed to India, is have we succeeded in that? We've tried, we, we've had a, a, a equal protection, before that, I should have mentioned too, a ban on the establishment of religion, which is an early way of getting at the problem of caste, that there is no religion which is superior to another, no person that is superior based on religion. Uh, but yet we're seeing the real vulnerability of the American system precisely because of the diagnosis that Mill gave, minus the racism. It's, it, it is white supremacy, just to be blunt about it, that poses the danger to uh, the American structure, the American experiment success. Uh, in a way that maybe actually, uh, I mean, the book left me optimistic about India, maybe a way that, that, that India is not. So 
my big question is, I have one question, what can we learn from India about how to do this more successfully to create a democratic society, not just a democratic structure? Thank you, Corey. Um, perhaps um, in our discussion after the commentary, Madhav would say something, or some of us would say something on whether democracy under Prime Minister Modi is showing the vulnerabilities that you are talking about, Corey, in the American case also. Yes. Yeah, what that is, is the, really the hardest... what is the Indian Indian equivalent of white supremacy as a threat to democracy? Yes. That's a or, way of putting it. Or whether whether Indian federalism and I, I, let's see what Luis has to say. Whether Indian federalism is as big a threat to a democratic culture as it is in America, I think her answer perhaps will be different, but let's see what her answer is. Um, so let's turn to, thank you, Corey. Thank you for these, uh, these wonderful comparative reflections. Let's turn to, uh, to, to Luis. Luis. Thank, thank you very much, Ashu, and, and to Madhav for that um, lovely scene setting, but also particularly to Corey for having set the stage, I think, for a, for a really fascinating debate about this book. And actually, you somewhat preempted some of the argument I'm going to make, which I think is somewhat more pessimistic than, than that, that that Corey has just set out about the Indian case. But, but let me start um, by setting out what I think is so significant about this book. And I think I, I'd like to start by saying that as a scholar of federalism and a scholar of Indian federalism, I have always found Madhav's writing on the Indian constitution to be refreshing um, and refreshing from a constitutional scholar because it treats federalism as such a central element of India's constitutional schema. Um, and he takes care, um, and this book offers us the, the fullest exposition of his views on of the, the significance of Indian federal design, but he, he's, he takes particular, particular care to treat India's centralized federal model not as a diminished subtype of federalism, a diminished version of, of, of the, the kind of the, the American ideal type, but rather as a distinctive approach to federalism in its own right uh, that was shaped by the particular constitutional imagination of, of the mid 20th century in India. And, and I, in my remarks, I'm going to focus particularly on, 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 on the second chapter of the book on, on the location of power. And in this chapter, Madhav invites us to understand the choice of India's founders for a strong centralized state, but nonetheless a federal state, as a choice that was driven by the imperative of forming a state that would be capable of reconstituting interpersonal relations at the local level. And especially for Nehru and for Ambedkar, the centralized model of federalism that the Constituent Assembly adopted um, and of course, this was a model that was adopted in, in the, the wake of the decision um, of partition, which allowed the Constituent Assembly to set aside the need for a more decentralized model of federalism that might offer a, a mode of accommodating Muslim majority provinces. The choice of a centralized model of federalism in those circumstances was taken in order to liberate Indians from localism. And so Madhav encourages us to see the choice of a centralized state as intrinsic to the project of statehood itself, um, one that reflected an understanding of the porosity of the boundary between the state and society at the local level, and a reflection that regional territories did not have the capacity to become states, i.e. they were unable to construct the kind of impersonal force that could counteract the tenacity of local cultural forms. And while Madhav also spends considerable time um, in the book on, on modernization and state-led industrialization as providing a logic for centralism, and this of course was important in, in Nehru's thinking, but also in Ambedkar's, um, for me it's the argument about the necessity of a centralized state um, as crucial for the reconstitution of interpersonal relations and thus for the uh, thus for democratization itself, this is to me the most innovative part of his argument. And I think it's important for a number of reasons. Rather than seeing federalism as a means of protecting the rights of individuals against an overpowerful central government, which of course before the mid 20th century was one of the main arguments in favor of the more decentralized models of federalism, of course, of which the US is, a, is the classic example. 
India's constitutional designers, in, in my daughter's telling, saw central authority as crucial for liberating Indians from local patterns of social dominance, and in particular caste. So this inverts the assumption that federalism protects democracy by dividing power in order to prevent the tyranny of the majority. It also in some ways moves beyond the findings of a quite wide literature in comparative politics that has seen the opening up of spaces for contestation at the subnational level as a factor that has contributed to national level trajectories of democratization. Um, this is a model of, of democracy that is built from the center outwards. Um, and Madhav tells us that the Indian model sought to embed democracy precisely by aggregating authority in order to produce and protect individual ag agency to enable the state to act on society and to lead social change. And so I think the significance of the argument that's made here lies in the invitation to recognize what is distinctive about the form of federalism that India adopted, to note the ways and the reasons for which it departed from earlier federal models, which were premised on the demarcation of separate spheres of central and regional authority, and which uh, had adopted constitutions which checked um, and placed uh, considerable, considerably greater limits on federal powers of intervention in the affairs of the state, in, in the affairs of uh, states. So for all these reasons, I think uh, the argument here is important in pushing us to appreciate and be able to articulate what is distinctive, uh, a distinctive departure in the Indian model of federalism. The book also, I think, encourages us to push beyond some of the historiography um, of Indian federalism, such that there is uh, much of a historiography. Um, I think uh, Madhav convincingly argues that we should see the kind of centralism that India adopts um, as something other than a choice that was pushed on the Constituent Assembly or on Nehru as a result of partition in order to deter further attempts at secession. That, if you like, is probably the kind of main argument that is often used in the literature on Indian federalism to explain its degree of centralization. Um, but I also think he helps us move beyond another line of argument, which is that the centralism that we see in the Indian constitution reflects an essential continuity with, with the colonial architecture of governance, and especially the legacy of the Government of India Act of 1935. So I think for all of those reasons, this is a very significant account, not only of the Indian constitution, but also of the shaping of Indian federalism, which um, much like the Indian constitution has also exerted a fairly profound influence on other post-colonial um, uh, post um, constitutional bargains elsewhere. But for all this, and this is where I, I really pick up from from Corey's uh, opening remarks. For all of this, given the juncture at which the book has been published, um, I was hoping for somewhat more reflection, and I hope that's something we can tease out in this discussion, um, in at least the concluding chapter of the book on the implications of this form of constitutional design for democracy today, um, especially in light of the forms of centralization that are taking shape in India as we speak. And indeed, of course, the forms of centralization that have threatened the functioning of democracy in the past in India, especially in the 1970s. The constitution, as Mada sets out in, in the second chapter, very deliberately placed um, limited checks on the power of the center to intervene in the affairs of the states. Um, and this has meant that the actual functioning of federalism um, and the past decades in which India has coalesced into something of a more rounded federal system have really relied on the nature of the party system and the, const the constellation of political power. And I think today in India we are witnessing a very profound challenge to what had become a de facto federal bargain in the decades of multi-party fragmentation between 1989 and 2014, which had produced a much uh, clearer balance between the authority and autonomy of central government on one hand and state governments on the other. Many authors had seen that trajectory as practically irreversible, but this was a scenario of ever deeper federalization. But in the situation of one party dominance in parliament, of the kind that we've seen under, under the BJP and Prime Minister Modi since 2014, we have a very stark 
um, reflection of the fact of the, the limited constitutional checks that exist on a project of centralization. And the kind of centralization that we see in India today, of course, goes hand in hand with a form of Hindu majoritarian nationalism, which has its own project to reconstitute society in ways that fully strengthen the very communal identities that Madhav in chapter three of India's founding moment argues were set aside as bases for political representation in the constitution. So I think we see that the very potential of state power to reconstitute society is being used to quite different ends today. Um, I, I was, I mean, the, the other form of identity that is crucial to political subjectivity, um, but I think perhaps receives surprisingly little attention in the book is language. Um, and I think if we think of the design of state power with reference to the, to the language question, we end up with a slightly different picture of um, the, the resolution of, of uh, representation and its mediation by identity. Um, I think that the constituent assembly, of course, left the language question unresolved, uh, whether that was a question as to whether language, regional languages should serve as the determinants of the boundaries of Indian states within the federal system or the, the very thorny question of what India's national language would be. Um, and of course, the flexibility that was inherent in the centralized design of federalism um, allowed the central government to oversee successive rounds of reorganization of state boundaries that helped effectively to accommodate linguistic minorities and to embed a, 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 a deeper form of federalism that over time um, came to enshrine clearer boundaries between state and, and central power. But I think what we see in the present is that the very same flexibility um, that enabled those processes of federal redesign um, and accommodative politics, that very same flexibility is also being used, has also been used in more recent times to undermine the potential of federalism to, to strengthen democratic citizenship. Um, and the absence of a constitutionally protected division of center state powers that cannot be unilaterally rescinded, which is a kind of crucial feature of the centralized design of Indian federalism, generates, I think, the additional sting that India's constitutional design contains within itself potentially features that threaten to undermine the very goals of its founders. Um, so I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that I am in full agreement with the book, which I think is a, a tremendous contribution to scholarship on Indian democracy and on, on the, the, the con India's constitutional design, um, that I'm in full agreement that the choice of a, central, a centralized federal design is one of the most distinctive features of the Indian constitution. But I'm left with the question as to whether what Ambedkar described as the amphibian nature of the constitution, that is its ability to be both unitary or federal according to circumstances, has become a risk to the, to the very kind of democratic citizenship that the founders of the constitution aspire to and, I, and which I think Madhav explicates so eloquently in, in this book. And I will end there. Ashu, have we, have we? Ashu, I think you're it? muted and I see you trying to talk, but I think you're muted. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. So as in the interest of time, let's move quickly to Sunil um, for his remarks. Uh, we'll pick up on a couple of points that Louise made about the relationship between the federal design and creation of democratic citizens uh, a little later. Sunil. Thank you, everyone. And, and thanks for having me in this discussion. I just want to start by echoing um, the, the previous speakers and saying how much I admire Madhav's book. I, I think it's an elegant and admirably concise and, and far reaching intervention. Um, my brief is to address it as a historian and that is very much how, how I read the book. I'll focus on one key argument that runs throughout the book and which Madhav also touched on in his uh, remarks earlier today, which is the question of recognition. Why is it that India's founding moment, India's constitutional moment, um, 
has not had the recognition, both in sort of disciplinary terms, but perhaps more broadly in political discourse, uh, that Mother feels it deserves. Um, so I'd like to start by reflecting on, on extending some of what Madhav says about why historians have not recognized this moment uh, quite as much and quite as centrally as Madhav himself has. Um, early in the book, Madhav has a very uh, rather amusing account of the so-called Cambridge School of, of Indian History of the 1960s and 1970s, uh, which uh, Tapan Roy Chaudhary described as sort of animal politics. And this, uh, in, in Madhav's description, this was a view of Indian politics suggesting that modern India was born out of a series of self-interested compromises and arrangements between the Raj and locals. And clearly that sort of hangs heavy in the ways in which some historians interpret what actually happens in 1947. I think there are other currents of historiography that also uh, lead to similar um, conclusions, even though they're very, very different in their points of emphasis. You see this in the subaltern studies work and a lot of post-colonial criticism, uh, where Indian nationalism and presumably by implication the constitution itself is seen as somehow a derivative discourse. You see in a lot of the recent historiography an emphasis on the power of colonial categories uh, so pervasive that they sort of cast a long shadow on modern India. And then there's a sort of temporal dimension that, you know, until recently, there was almost a division of labor between historians and political scientists. You know, historians of South Asia, to an extraordinary extent, focused on the colonial period. And only in the last 10 or 15 years have they really strayed into the 1940s and 50s, which is why it's very interesting that's just sort of think of two historians um, who've written books that very much I see as counterparts to Madhav's so Rohit Day and Orni Chani, who is, is with us today. Uh, but for a long time, um, Indian history ends in 1947 and it ends catastrophically, it ends with partition. And I think Madhav is right that that ending sort of overshadows the beginning that Madhav sort of pinpoints. Um, I think most historians would probably be somewhat surprised at how little partition figures in Madhav's story, but I think he makes clear that his aims are quite different, that he sees this as a revolutionary moment in its own right. And there are two arguments he makes there that I think are, are compelling ones. Uh, one is simply that ideas matter. The second, and I'm quoting from Mother's introduction, is that the choices underlying the birth of modern India were not forced by historical forces or strategic currents. Um, that I think is a real sort of challenge to historians and, and something that I think historians will, will want to think about. Um, there's another way in which I think Mother's work is quite a departure from at least the sensibility of a lot of recent work in the history of ideas which is that Madhav's book is not a book about paths not taken. Whereas I think so much recent historical scholarship has been about, really about defeated futures. Uh, historians I think have turned, especially those who've looked at uh, you know, various anti-colonial thinkers in the 1920s and 30s, they've looked to these other futures that never came to be. You know, a lot of them looking at currents on the left, but, but not exclusively so. And I think what Madhav is doing, of course, is something very different. And one of the striking things that Madhav points out is how few of the members of India's Constituent Assembly um, argued otherwise in the sense of argued against universal franchise. Um, so, so it's, I think, a work in a very different spirit to a lot of recent historical work. The second point I want to make uh, stays with this point of recognition of why has this moment not been recognized. Um, Madhav is writing, you know, as a political theorist, and he puts India's constitutional moment in a lineage that reaches uh, back to the American Revolution in particular, but the French Revolution to some extent as well. As a historian, I'd be equally interested and indeed inspired by Madhav's work to sort of think also synchronically, uh, but laterally, to think, you know, to what extent is this an Asian moment and not just an Indian one? And I'd like to think a little bit about what else is happening at this time. And, and the, in my, to, what Madhav's book brought to my mind was in fact an image of the Asian Relations Conference of March and April 1947, um, where a number of Asia's future leaders came together in Delhi to meet in the Purana Kila. And these, even just the imagery of the Asian Re Relations Conference is very striking. And uh, behind the stage is this map of Asia now newly connected by, by air routes, by aviation routes. Um, Nehru makes a very important speech uh, at the beginning to open the conference about you know, the reconnection of Asia. And one of the things that strikes me is of course that almost everyone there 
was in the midst of drafting constitutions at that moment in 1947, and that most of them made very, very different choices to India's constitutional architects. Um, and I think one of the things that comes up in the Asian Relations Conference is the question of diasporas. The fact that in particular, the Indian and Chinese diasporas produced dilemmas in Southeast Asia, but I'm not sure that it actually produced such a dilemma for India's constitutional founders. I mean, it is not clear that the existence of Indians overseas was something that was seen as particularly significant or important. So that uh, you know, leads me to this question that, you know, Madhav talks about the simultaneity of India's uh, democratization and its constitution making. There's a sort of third element of that simultaneity, which is it's that moment too that India is a sort of creating an international personality for itself. Um, and there are a lot of interesting um, tensions, I think, in the late 1940s, where on the one hand, you know, India at the UN is raising the question of uh, anti-Indian discrimination in South Africa. At the same time that uh, Nehru in particular and many of India's other leaders are, are keen not to go into that issue so much in terms of India's immediate neighborhood. Nehru is not interested in the treatment of Indians in Malaya, for example, or in Burma even uh, to, that, to, to, to any great extent. So there is this whole question about citizenship, the debates about citizenship that the constitutional founders are going on, uh, are sort of crafting at that moment, and, and the international dimension, particularly in India's sort of immediate entry into these international politics around sovereignty and anti-colonial um, politics. Uh, the final point I want to make is also about recognition. Um, and that is, um, this is a story that's often told, particularly in comparative politics, of, as, as one of Indian exceptionalism. So, you know, India maintains democracy when most of its neighboring countries uh, do not. But to look at it another way, reading Madhav's book makes me reflect on how surprisingly little India was seen as a model or even as an inspiration uh, in its own region. And this is very much in contrast to the 1920s and 30s when the Gandhian mass, co uh, mass non-cooperation movement was really a sort of beacon for other countries. I think that actually in the 1940s, I'm struck and just thinking about this really as a result of reading Mother's book, at how little India is seen as a model for other Asian countries, even just to sort of stick with the immediate region. And I think there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is that in the minds of many other Asian const uh, constitutional drafters and, and political leaders, there was this prior urgency of social and economic questions. Um, and, and this, of course, is something that Madhav shows is, is so much a legacy of a colonial way of thinking about India's suitability or unsuitability for democracy. But the point I want to make is that that argument is, is a very powerful one in other parts of Asia. And in fact, a lot of them would point to the sort of undemocratic features of Indian, India's society and economy as a reason not to emulate India's political form. The second reason, I think, has to do with ideas of revolution. I think Madhav makes a very persuasive case that this is a revolutionary moment. But in the eyes of many others, um, Asian anti-colonial activists, it's, it's not. Um, and I'm struck uh, by what the Indonesian novelist and uh, leftist activist Pramudya Anantator writes when he visits India for the first time in 1958. Uh, he writes a letter to his daughter in which he says, India, uh, Indonesia is much better off than India. Um, and I quote, this is because India, Indonesia has gained its freedom through revolution and not as a gift from its former colonizer. Of course, Madhav shows that that's, a, that that's in many ways an absurd way to think of India's independence, but that's how many others saw it. That India gained its independence as a gift from its uh, former colonizer and Pramodia concludes, walking on Indian soil, I feel like a tourist, not a student. And his whole argument was India has nothing to offer Indonesia. And I think, you know, recent work like Julia Lovell's brilliant global history of Maoism, you know, shows the, the other kinds of models that perhaps had more purchase um, in the region in the 1950s. Um, so final point is that, you know, when Martha writes that the Indian constitutional moment uh, should be the most significant when we think about the much more recent wave of constitutional constitution writing. Um, that's perhaps a normative question, you know, perhaps the Indian constitutional moment should be um, central to how we think about contemporary constitution drafting in the global south. Uh, but I think there's also this legacy of, of a sort of conscious rejection of, of, of the Indian model that we see, and we probably still see, especially in relation to the relative influence of India and China uh, across large parts of Asia and indeed other parts of the world. Um, so just conclude by saying, you know, what a treat this book has been to engage with and, and how glad I am to be part of this conversation. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Um, let me, as a moderator, uh, summarize three points here, which have emerged, and perhaps Mother would like to uh, address them, or he may have his own uh, own extraction of points for discussion. One, uh, the claim that um, Corey made, which is that um, the Constitution uh, of America, uh, unlike Mother's claim uh, about India, could not constitute a fully democratic society. Um, and it tried certainly in the, as we know, in the 14th, uh, 13th, 14th and 15th amendment, make it much more democratic, the constitution by giving blacks the right, right to vote, enshrining their uh, citizenship, et cetera. And, and of course, ab abolition of slavery, we are the 13th. But nonetheless, you have a, 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 a big problem um, which takes the form of the presidential power, um, which appears somewhat unconstrained and sometimes almost entirely unconstrained. Um, and second, uh, federalism does not necessarily produce democ uh, a more dem uh, democratic citizenry in America because uh, some, some of the states, by, uh, while using their rights, have actually opposed equality. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and instituted, even after the abolition of slavery, uh, the so-called Jim Crow era is the victory of state rights over Washington in the South. So, uh, uh, and uh, Lewis's point that federalism uh, in India is, appears not to be a check on the majoritarian impulses that might emerge from, from Delhi either, which has been happening perhaps in, in recent years. So a comment on that. The comment, um, if you if you if you think that's uh, worthy of, uh, of 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 further reflection, the second, the Sunil's point can be uh, can be presented as an Isaiah Berlin point. So this whole idea of positive liberty and negative liberty. Positive liberty is about uh, socio-economic liberation, mm -hmm. uh, get rid of poverty, make everyone literate, uh, etc. That could be viewed as positive liberty. And as you know, there is a uh, there is certainly one that is certainly what uh, uh, Singapore's leader and Chinese and Soviet leaders have said that democracy, the so-called democracy is essentially negative liberty and the Soviets liberated Soviet citizens, the Ch Mao liberated Chinese citizens and, and Lee Kuan Yew liberated Singapore by making every citizen less poor and perhaps not poor and, and, and introducing 100% literacy. For them, that was a more interesting way of thinking about uh, democracy than simply elections um, mandated every five years. So, um, so this is a rich uh, uh, set of thoughts. Um, and let's see, Madhav, you have up to, let me see what time it is. Well, how, how about five minutes, five to seven minutes? That's great. Okay, thanks so much, um, Ashu. So I'll I'll just I, I think I'll I'll begin sort of backwards and I'll begin with Sunil just to because Sunil's points are more historical and then move to sort of Corey and Luis, which are which touch a little bit more on the present. And I just I mean I'm so grateful really to all of you. Um, so Sunil, I so I I I think you're quite right to identify sort of two further lines of, of thinking that uh, about why the constitutional moment wasn't such a big deal, right? And of course, the, the, the Cambridge School is just, I mean, I, I, my sense is that it's less that scholarship as much as the shadow that that scholarship cast on ways of imagining the, the, the region. But I, in your in your comments, and I, and I, and I think sort of it, I sort of flirt with it in the introduction, but don't really go much into it. Is I my sense is that there are two kinds of left thinkings, right? Two two different sort of works on the left or ways of thinking on the left about this. One is the thought about it being derivative, right, as a kind of conceptual category, you know, and I think there the answer that the Indian founders seem to give is very much the kind of thing that sort of Kwame Anthony Apia picks up in his stuff on Africa, right? And basically the thought that actually what these people think is that 
thinking about it in terms of Western or non-Western is a, is a kind of intellectual error because they see these as universal values, right? And so that's sort of the old RPR line where, you know, the, the region is post-colonial, not in the sense that it moves beyond colonialism, right? But just in the sense that it's, an, it's a region that was once inhabited by a colonial force. And so I, 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 I think that their answer isn't that this is Indian or we want Western. It's that that's the wrong way to think about it. And I think the second kind of left approach, which is something Ashu sort of just linked to, right, is the idea that this is not the site of revolution. So all those people who are basically thinking about poverty or justice or whatever, I mean, their point is not that this is not a constitutional revolution, is that constitutions are not revolutionary. And so in some sense, constitutional revolution is almost an oxymoron because this isn't the site of revolution. And so like, Madhav, you're, you're crazy for studying this because this is not the site of action, right? The action is elsewhere. And so I think in some sense, the book is very much a response to those years of, I think, left historical scholarship and to sort of recover a slightly more, I think, liberal, a, 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 a sort of slightly more liberal centrist view about thinking about politics or about democratic constitutionalism, that these things sort of matter, right? Because I think both the left and the right, they don't take that constitutionalism story seriously. Right. Or, and, and rightly so, like it, it, it should not be taken seriously within the internal logic of their argument. Right. But I, I, I do think that, that there are those two separate strands within the left. I mean, I think the partition question is interesting and important. I only touch upon it, I think, in significance in the in the chapter on representation, because that's where it, I think it has real philosophical significance. I think that um, that aside from its sort of dramatic social, social and political significance, it has genuine philosophical significance on the representation question because it genuinely changes the debate, right? And not just for contingent reasons, but because people actually begin to think about the power of identity very differently. Um, I think the synchronic point is right. And, and I actually, I think the other interesting examples, right, which need to be unpacked far more than they have, but it's sort of the story to be written is actually Germany, Israel, and Japan, right? And each of the three have sort of been studied in very particular, very, very particular ways. I think like in the Indian case, none doing fully justice to the range of questions there. But I think those are three other constitutional moments that are basically happening at the same time. And so I think that apart from it being the Asian moment, it's also a general moment for non, it's not only a moment of post-colonial constitutionalism, right? So, and, and I, I, I sort of, I sell that a little bit more than is perhaps true, but the truth is it's neither only post-colonial, nor is it um, simply Asia, right? And so I, and I, I, I think what it is though, and this is a dramatic move intellectually, right? By the time you reach 1950, that goes from like, it moves beyond like from Hannah Arendt to Gandhi to everybody, is it's a moment for the unambiguous victory of the nation state. So I think that's what's special about that moment, right? That basically all forms of, all forms of either subnational or supranational arrangements whether you talk about India's proposed cabinet mission plan or you talk about a federal Europe, all vanish, right? And that story sort of needs to be written. And, and my, I mean, frankly, I think, I do think that that's actually one area where the alternative historical accounts, right? The defeated futures, as you so eloquently put it, I think the one thing that they don't fully embrace is at least in the Indian writing, a lot of them bemoan how it went out of fashion. But my sort of question to them is, well, why did it succeed nowhere? And so that's just sort of to put it out and, 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 and to put it out there, sort of just on those three amazing points. So Corey and, and Luis, um, thank you so much. I mean, you're quite right to begin to the present. I should say two reasons why I didn't focus on the present in the book, right? One is purely for the personal um, reason that I, my, my real fear is that I write books that become outdated, 
right? Because I anyway know that they are irrelevant. And the only thing worse than something irrelevant is that it's irrelevant and outdated. And so I was very eager that it ends in 1950. So that whatever happens later, right, the story isn't now wrong. But the second is a genuine intellectual reason, which is part of the argument of the book is that the constitution making moment is serious, is, is serious and is significant. And if I take that argument seriously, then it shouldn't matter what happened to modern India. Insofar as that argument holds, I'm not really sure that the subsequent story is, is significant to the claim of that argument, right? Because what I want to suggest is that that's an interesting constitutional moment in its own right. And of course, if it's it, India has succeeded remarkably given that period, but had it not, it would have been maybe another defeated futures type of story, right? But it's but I, but part of why I didn't want to get into the present is I didn't want to justify the book's argument in a small, almost retrospective way. I think the points that you and Louise both raise, right, about the success and failure, and in some sense, that's what you really carefully and powerfully pinpoint on, and you do it in different ways, right? On the one hand, by the unitary centralizing forces that Louise points to, and Corey, you sort of highlight the substantive justice and substantive due process angle. I would just say that my sort of sense of it is that it's a mistake to look at constitutions as things that determine success or failure. And in the sense that I think the ultimate success or failure of a constitutional project rests on factors that are external to that project. And the minute factors that are external to that project break down or lose faith in that project, that project is not going to automatically work, right? So I don't think you can change a clause or add an institution and you get it, right? I think what's interesting about India's constitutional founding is you have a genuine elite political consensus external to the document that takes the document seriously, right? That basically says, look, this is how we're going to rewire the people. And you almost are going to need that external document. And then as it works out, there's obviously a dynamic, right? Between the internal and the external. But I think in many ways, the American story or moments in Indian history tell the story of where you've lost a certain commitment perhaps to American principles or Indian founding or something. And then you're not really going to get, then the document can't do its work, right? So I almost look at it like almost, I mean, the analogy I've sometimes used is like a refrigerator, right? You put food in it and it'll, it'll preserve the food in a certain way. But if you choose to plug it out, the food is not going to work on its own, right? And so I think that constitutions aren't self-executing. So you're going to need some kind of external, and I think that that's, that may be good or bad, but I think that's the place of politics. Right. And so I think that we have to be very careful when we distinguish between failures of constitutionalism and failures of actually democratic politics. And the point of the constitution isn't to substitute democratic politics, it's to make it possible. So the question is that can you keep generating a democratic politics that takes constitutionalism seriously? I think that that's kind of the challenge, right? And, and so I, I, I think both your, both your, your, your points were, were, they absolutely touched on something crucial, but I think to fully grasp that story, there is an internal external dynamic, right? And we're going to need some way to sort of think about how they both interact. Okay, I'll stop there, Ashu. So, so Madhav, then I think you're proposing something like this from a comparative politics, empirical social science sense. You're saying it's not only constitutions that constitute democratic citizens, which is one of the claims of the book, but also external agents. And what, what happens to those who come to power in democratic politics and what their view of the constitution might be. So there are two, two things going on here. Constitution is making democratic citizens. Right, Ashu, because I mean, the simple way to think about it is this, right? Let's say that you have a country with a constitutional court and somebody says, oh, the leader of the country, he or she got away with X thing because, yeah. you know, the court, um, there was no constitutional court to stop them. The simple answer to that is even if there was a constitutional court to stop them, why should they listen to the court? 
So you're going to need some external commitment to that overall constitutional project. Otherwise, the project can't work, right? The question is, where do you get that? And th then, of course, the political science question becomes, where do you get that external commitment from, right? And there was a lot of external commitment in the 50s and 60s in that generation. That you, so you're saying one reason for the success of the constitution, early success, was that the, the, the early elite were seriously committed to the constitution. No, no I, I, I think that that's unambiguously right. And you've written on that. And, you know, other people have written on that, right? That in some sense, this moment is one where there is an external commitment. And the puzzle I'm interested in is that given that there's that external commitment, given that Nehru, Ambedkar, others think India can be a self-sustaining democracy, how do they make that work? And why do, how do they even like think of that thought? Okay, so 15 minutes left for uh, questions from the audience and we have Arushi Kalra helping us. She has, uh, she will pick the questions that have come through the chat. Arushi, can you read out maybe a couple to begin with? Uh, that yeah. you think are, yeah. Uh, thank Arushi you. Kalra is a graduate student in, 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 uh, in, no. Petra. yeah. Uh, uh, so I think a lot of the questions that uh, have been asked in the chat have been already addressed. Uh, by the speakers and by Madhav then. Uh, but I guess uh, one question to begin with is uh, to Madhav uh, saying, do you feel that the pedagogical tendencies, for instance, the directive principles of state policy of the Indian constitution were insufficient or incomplete to actualize the democratic revolution? If yes, what more could have been done? Uh, let me add something to, to the question. The, the directive principles of, uh, of state policy in India's constitution are the so-called socio-economic rights as opposed to political rights, all right, which go, in, go towards Berlin's concept of positive liberty, which, is not, which was not constitutionally enshrined as legally required. It was constitutionally enshrined as a normative principle, a normative principle in the constitution, which is not legally required. That's the problem there. So, okay, wonderful question. What do you say, Madhav? Ashu, my answer is that I actually think it is legally required. It's okay. just not legally enforceable in a court of law. Those are two separate things. I see. Right? Go ahead. So, everything in the constitution is legally required. You want to separate something that's legally required and something that's legally enforceable, just as you want to separate something that's legally enforceable and something that is um, that, that that is legally that is illegal, right? For example, two people can enter into a contract that the law may not enforce, but the contract may not be illegal, right? So for instance, Sunil and I could enter into a contract where Sunil has to pay me a hundred dollars every month and I have to do nothing. And this contract would not be legally enforceable because there's no quid pro quo and legally enforceable contracts require both parties to give something to the other. But, it, it, but the law will not um, punish us for having this contract. Similarly, you can have something that's legally required but is not legally enforceable and i think that the question of whether it should be enforceable in a court of law was simply a question of institutional design and there i think sort of corey rightly pointed us to the massive debate over the american experience with substantive due process and what the american experience with substantive due process in the first half of the 20th century captured for india scholars is that the judiciary has a very poor track record of actually dealing effectively with substantive due process claims. And so they basically felt that, look, given that, the narrow question of institutional design should be which part, which institution you should give it to, which is an almost kind of instrumental question, right? Like, I, we, this is legally required, but is A going to, be a, going to do a better job of enforcing it or B? So I do think that it, that it is actually legally required. Um, yeah, Arushi, go ahead. This is a very interesting um, distinction in drawing that the directive principles are legally required, but not legally enforceable. We should think about right. this. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but, but the question uh, perhaps is also asking you to address, uh, as, you, as you've hinted, that these provisions may be incomplete or insufficient to actualize the democratic revolution. 
And uh, if that is the case, what more do you think could have been done? Um, so thanks, Arushi. I actually don't think so. In fact, I think that a lot has gone wrong by making those provisions enter the realm of, at least in the Indian example, and I think some countries have done it very effectively like South Africa, but in the Indian example, you had a lot that's been muddled, right, in the role of, in the judicial involvement in them. I, I actually don't think that it's the provisions themselves that's been incomplete. I think it's the politics around them that's been incomplete. I think that the, the big story there is the politics of welfare. I think that that's, that's sort of what needs the attention, not so much the constitutional imagination around it. Other questions, Arushi? Um, yeah, so there was uh, one perhaps that, was, that relates to what uh, Corey said earlier. Yeah. And this is about uh, illiteracy and casteism being a big challenge in this successful model of democracy. Uh, but uh, this question is essentially asking us to think about pseudo-nationalism and the similar fissures in the American society and American democracy in the past couple of years. Um, I think this can be more sharply formulated. And I think, I think we should push Madhav to take a position on this. Is <laughs> Hindu majoritarianism the Indian equivalent of white supremacy in America? And, I mean, I, to democ and a threat I, to democracy? The thing is that I... I, I sort of, Ashok, the, the, the reason I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to answer that, right, and, I, and I've been writing extensively on contemporary Indian politics, so it's not sort of a, is, is that I'm not, sh I, I, I think that it, it does injustice, right, those analogs, simply because they are coming out of such deeply, deeply different historical moments, right, and different forces. I think what is unambiguously true is that under the under the sort of constitutional vision, right? And I buy that vision. Mm -hmm. Unless you have representation unmediated by identity, you're not going to take freedom seriously. And I think that in multiple ways, both the American and the Indian example have failed on those registers, right? But I think that what's, what's special or what's meaningful in that story is how actually, if you take democratic politics seriously, you're going to have to liberate people from groups that you essentialize them into. And you're going to have to liberate people from compulsory categories. You're going to have to believe that actually self-identification is a core principle of democratic freedom. But it's, it would seem that if you make that claim that that would be could be a sound philosophical claim, but never been realized in any polity. I mean, I, I'm not sure, Ashu, whether the question is, has it ever been or never been realized? I think the question is that, are there degrees to which we can imagine countries that have realized it, right? Yeah. And are there degrees to which we think that it can no longer even be in a meaningful way? So it, it may never be perfectly realized, right? Just as the rule of law, is an ideal that may never be perfectly realized because the rule of law requires clear laws and language is inherently sort of vague. But you, um, but but I think that that countries have realized it to some degrees more than others. And I think India has realized it at certain historical moments better than at other historical moments, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, other other questions, or we can return to the. I had I had I had a question for Madhav too, I, and I think I'm speaking too much, so I'll, I'll I won't ask any further. Mother, John Stuart Mill is very silent in you. He's very and silent. I'm puzzled. I'm puzzled that a political theorist of your stature now, uh, so widely being noted, has remained so silent on John Stuart Mill in the book. Now, John, no. it plays such a big role in Uday Mehta's book. Uh, and most of us have been influenced by John Stuart Mill's analysis, his analysis of John Stuart Mill. And Mill is basically saying Indians are not capable of democracy because they don't, they are not sufficiently rational. And they're right. It, it's so the, 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 the Brits uh, have, have, have capacity for higher rationality. Indians do not. And therefore Indians cannot be democratic. The other problem is that uh, Mill is also opposed to poor people getting the vote. Mill is, Mill is in favor of women getting the vote, but he's opposed to uh, poor people getting the vote. 
he doesn't think that poor people can can meaningfully use the vote uh, as a as a mechanism um, so so a, a vote the idea of vote based democracy is is confined to those who have the rational capacity to judge and then vote hmm? right. that rational judgment must must precede the act of vote and only some cultures or some classes have but how important is this we know it's very important i have read uh, accounts of british administrators in 1880s and 1890s extremely important at that point this argument uh 19th 19th also it's very important how important is this argument in the 1940s certainly in the way the the intellectual elite of the west is looking at the indian experience Great. so i mean i would say sort of four things right about that one is that i think it's a it's a mistake to think that this is only myth right so we should we should just not do that because this okay. is all of 19 this is representative of 19th century political thought in the west it's tocqueville it's walter bachot it's dicey it's everybody so that's the first thing okay like you just need to read the first 10 pages of walter bachot's the english constitution and to see that the second is that it's not straightforward racism and it would be a mistake to think that i think in in a in an earlier generation it <laughs> is i think that in the case of of mill and tocqueville and bachot and and so on they are actually grappling with something quite profound which is that they are grappling with the relationship between the political domain the social domain and the economic domain which until the middle of the 19th century don't acquire their independent force and so they are really the first group of people who are thinking about the relationship between politics and the surrounding social and economic spheres and whether politics depend on depends on those spheres or is a consequence of those spheres right and uh, whether whether it creates them or or, or is or is created by them so i i think that that's sort of the second thing to say i think the third is that the reason why it's not covered so much in the book is precisely for the reason you mentioned that the book isn't about english political thought right so in some sense the book is about what happens after mill or what happens after walter bachot or what happens after dicey i think the argument if you sort of take the argument as part of a larger subset of arguments which basically say that until you have an a set of socio economic conditions you can't get democracy that's the ultimate upshot of the argument it is very much there in certain quarters even in 1950 right so i think the most interesting example and a remarkable figure is the cambridge lawyer evo jennings evo jennings travels to ceylon he travels to india he gives important lectures in chennai in 1951 on the new indian constitution and he basically explicitly writes at the time that look india shouldn't go for universal suffrage and so the argument has a deep deep imprint on thinking nonetheless right i mean all throughout that entire period but i i don't think it's just mill okay a and b i don't think it's just I I mean I almost think it's too easy to think that he's just straightforwardly racist. I think the question I I think they come to conclusions that are completely unpalatable. But the question that they are asking is what is the relationship between politics, society and the economy is a question that nobody's had to ask before the 19th century. Yeah, Because as a scholar as a scholar of ethnicity and nationalism I can add that I I tend to agree with what you're saying and I think I don't agree with Corey on on whether um Uh, John Stuart Mill is a racist. But John Stuart Mill is saying that the Basque and Breton people from Basque and Breton are also uncultured, and it's Parisian France which will which will tutor them. And he also makes the claim the Scottish Highlanders and Welsh must be must be tutored by the English because no. they are also uncultured, and they no. don't they they need to be their civilizational But, level should be raised before they become equal members of the democratic. Party. but asho to give you a sense of how tricky and complex this argument is at the time let's not for a moment forget something very simple that i mean ambedkar basically was reluctant to give tribal the right to vote you know as i explicitly quote in the book you know i mean ambedkar is 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 at at certain moments in his career and in his political thought he's concerned with that i see 
let's have uh, of one comment, one final comment from each of the panelists. So uh, just uh, before we conclude, Corey, you go first, then Luis, and then Sunil. One comment. It's great discussion. I love these uh, answers. I mean, I guess I would sort of um, maybe just try to throw back at you the argument of the book and I, your dialogue with Ashu brought out some of what I was going to say. But the power of the book, the main thesis, as I see it, or one of the main claims is about the enormous power of a constitution to shape the politics. Uh, so the more that you say, you know, politics is independent. I see that. I mean, that's not incompatible, of course. The Constitution doesn't have to shape every aspect of political life, but it might have more, well, I, I'll just say what I think. I think it does have more transformative power than you're allowing it, less in the book and more in, in the discussion today, that it really can potentially do things like create a na national right to an education. Um, you know, part of the interesting connection, this is on the history, is that the, the, the discussion with Frankfurter happens really before the success of the substantive due process jurisprudence in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. And the possibility of its success, I think, in the area of positive rights, of economic rights, which was being argued for in academia and just didn't take hold in the judiciary because of, well, the appointments and the political process. So I guess I would, you know, our, our kind of big discussion to be continued is I do think that constitutions not only have the transformative power that you're allowing in the book, but that it points to a much broader transformative power, not just of politics, but of culture. And then my main point is the reason why it matters now is because ultimately if the, the success or failure of that project will be about the non-racist part of Mill's question, which is the transformation of the culture and of the politics. I guess Mill on race is an interesting question. I certainly think he has, I teach him, I'm publishing a book uh, with Penguin Liberty on, it's a new edition of On Liberty. I think it should be taught and read, but I think that's compatible with the idea too, that he had certain racist views about uh, which populations were, as he puts it, not at the maturity of their faculties. Uh, a great discussion. I look forward to much, much more of this, just the beginning. Yeah. Luis, your final comment? Um, yeah, I mean, also very much enjoyed this, this, this subsequent discussion. Um, I think I'd agree with Corey a little there. Um, I, I was surprised, actually, in, in your response that you, you, that you downplayed to the extent you did the, trans, the independent transformative power of the Constitution um, as distinct from the political elites who you know, gave birth to it. Um, and, and, and that feels to me at odds with the, with the kind of with the spirit of, of the book. Um, uh, but you know, I mean, I, equally, you were absolutely right to say that there was a good reason to stop the book in 1950 and, and not to engage with, with the kind of contemporary trajectory of democracy. So in a way, you know, that was an unfair kind of you know comment of mine to, to, have, to have wanted the conclusion to reflect on, on democracy today. But it was really to try and push you to, to think about the implications of the very distinctive features of the, of the kind of Indian constitutional experiment for the future of democracy. And, and I, 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 my response to that question in, in a way is, would be to say that we have seen this year the tremendous popular association with, with the constitution in India through the Shaheen Bagh protests, you know, right. the, the appeal to the the appeal to constitutionalism um, as you know kind of central to to understanding and citizenship and and we see that also in other you know in Shani's work on on the history of the first elections and so on that the constitution you know has bred a form of democratic citizenship and in that you know we we may see its its salvation I'm alone. Um, but it, you know but it, it seems to me that um, we we ought to reflect on um, on, on whether there are kind of features of the constitutional architecture which um, well done, no? that's a challenge to democratic citizenship uh, in the present. Uh, Sunil, your final comment? Yeah. Just to say I've, I've really enjoyed this, not just an Asian moment or a post-colonial moment, but, to, but but a, a broader moment of constitutional making. And I think that, that the, you know, your invocation of Japan and, and Germany is, is very, very stimulating there and, and well worth thinking about. So thank you very much.
Well, it's my turn now to thank everyone, the three commentators, and especially Madhu, for, uh, for giving us the chance to discuss some very, very important ideas. Uh, this will be available on YouTube within the next four or five days or so, as on our Watson Institute channel. And uh, uh, I'm sure there were other questions as well, which we could not accommodate uh, in our 90 minutes. Um, but uh, thank you, Madhu. Uh, Luis, Corey, and Sunil for a wonderful discussion. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you for setting this up and thank you for writing it. Great. Thanks.